The Scientific Method in Psychology Hello! Like any other scientific discipline, psychology uses the scientific method to understand and predict human behavior and mental processes. So today we're just going to look at the very first of one of those four steps in the scientific method. Here you have a review. You've already learned this. You know that the scientific method has four important steps. Number one, identify the problem or define the question of what it is that you're going to be investigating. And we do this by developing a theory. Sometimes we call it a working hypothesis. Number two, we're going to start collecting data, perhaps by experimentation, perhaps by any of the methods that psychologists use to collect data, and that's going to be in the next lesson that we, that we have. Number three, we're going to analyze the data, interpret the results, draw conclusions, and possibly infer relationships between the different variables that we are examining. And number four, we might have to revise the theory, perhaps even reject it out completely and begin again. And if we don't have to revise the theory because we proved it, well then we're going to have to publish it so that other people can repeat our experiment. So today, we look at only the first step, defining a problem, and that begins with a good theory. But what's a good theory? To begin with, let's say that it is a comprehensive explanation for the event or the behavior that we are trying to investigate. In other words, it needs to be based on observation and include as much of the pertinent data that we observe as possible. So remember that at any point in this video, you should stop and perhaps uh, listen to it again or stop and read what's on the slide because I'm not going to say everything that's on the slide. You're also going to be taking notes and referring to your guided note um, Google Doc that comes with this uh, video. Here's an example of important information that must be included when we're forming a theory. Suppose we wanted to understand the antisocial behavior of young children in school. It would be a really big mistake to exclude information about the children's home life and their larger social setting, like where they live. To only observe the children in one setting without taking into consideration other information, other factors, or sometimes called variables, influencing, influencing their behavior would not be very scientific. In the world of theories and hypotheses, you might be surprised to discover that we can find many contradictions between them. You have already seen that there are at least five major approaches to studying human behavior and thought. Psychoanalysis, behaviorism, humanism, cognitive psychology, and neurological or the biological or biosocial psychology. Each of these might propose a theory for the antisocial behavior of children. When we see that theories contradict one another, it is important to look at the context in which we are observing our phenomena, because theory A might be true in one situation and not true in another. So pause the video for a minute to read this slide. Now, notice that theory A and theory B are contradictory. In what context might A be true? Out of mind, out of sight and out of mind. Well, if I think of my parking ticket, if it's out of sight, I won't be thinking about it. It'll be out of mind until the city sends me another bill and reminds me of my unpaid ticket, plus giving, giving me an admin charge. What about theory B? Absence makes the heart grow fonder. When a good friend is gone and their absence makes me think of them more, I crave to see them again. So in that context, it might be true. So what's important to understand in psychology is that our theories are not the same as, say, like the theory of gravity, which is really a law, and that the context of the phenomena that we're trying to study will help us choose the right theory to begin designing our experiment or our research. Each theory could be true in a different circumstance. Here's an example. Let's consider matches give light a kind of a theory. 
The context is really important for knowing when to use the match. Imagine that the lights have gone out in the house, the hydra is down, and you've got to find the breaker switch. You know it's in the garage. You know that striking a match will give you light. But if you know that your dad keeps gasoline for emergency purposes in the garage, striking a match might not be a good mm, theory to use in this context. So the context says that this is not a good course of action. So this is one example in which a theory might be good for one situation and not for another. So a good theory does four things. First, it's going to fit the known facts. What's obviously missing here? The top to the bathing suit. As I previously stated, it should be comprehensive, a theory should be, and exclude as much of the observable data as possible. If important information is omitted, the theory will be flawed from the beginning, as my example of the antisocial children that we're trying to study. The next characteristic of a good theory is that it should help us predict the behavior that we're trying to understand and even predict new discoveries. So much of our work in psychology is really producing research results that will lead to more questions and more discoveries. The third characteristic of a good theory is going to be the biggest part of this presentation and might be the most challenging thing for you to try to understand, but I've got some examples to help you. And that is that the theory must be falsifiable. So that doesn't mean that the theory is going to be proven false before we start testing it or that it is false, but falsifiable means that it might be proven to be false given certain information. So pause the video and read this slide. If the theory cannot be proven to be false, then it is a belief and not a theory because beliefs generally lie outside the range of things that can be proven. I've got some examples to help you understand what falsifiability means. In a nutshell, it means that I can prove this thing to be false. It doesn't mean that it's going to be false, but that given certain information, it might be false. And if it could be proven to be false, then it fits the criteria of falsifiability. Let's look at some of our examples. What about this one? The world is going to end. Is this theory falsifiable? Is there anything in that statement that can be proven to be false? What about this one? The guy with the banana in his ear is keeping the alligators away. How can we make these theories falsifiable? Think about anything that you can measure any quantity that you can apply to those theories that makes them measurable, that will bring the information to the theory that could potentially prove it to be false. Bring one fact to, this, to the theory and see if it might be true and or untrue. And if this can be proven wrong, then that means that it can be measured and then that means that a theory is testable. The problem with statements that are unfalsifiable is that anything you find could be considered proof or significant information or data for your weak theory. The only thing that can support a theory is data that can be tested, measured, and quantified in some way. This measuring process is what makes a theory falsifiable, not false. Falsifiability submits a theory to the test of science. If I said, God made me smart. Is there any way that this can be proven to be false? No, because the central claim of that statement is unfalsifiable, because it includes God. There is no way to bring information to that statement that would help us measure or quantify anything. What if you added this piece of information to the world is going to end? What if we added by June 21st, 2013? It could be proven wrong, 
if on June 22nd, when we woke up, we were still here? What about the guy with the bananas in, banana in his ear is keeping the alligators away? What piece of information could we add to this to help it be falsifiable? Well, what if we put the guy with the banana in an alligator swamp and gave him a context, added 20 alligators to him, or 5, or 10? Then we've added a piece of information that we could possibly measure and observe the behavior of the alligators and then possibly make some sort of a correlation between the banana in his ear and alligators staying away. Otherwise, there's not much help for this theory. Let's see if you can test this theory. Too much stress prevents someone from hitting their full potential. Hit pause and consider, is this theory falsifiable? If it is, why? If it's not, why? Why not? You're right, it's not falsifiable because it's too vague. What does full potential mean? And how can I measure that? What does stress mean? And how do I measure stress? What about this one? All things being equal, people need more time to memorize a longer list of words than a shorter list of words. Again, pause the video and tell me if this is falsifiable. All things being equal means that the people that I'm going to use in this experimentation are of equal memorizing capabilities. In other words, I'm not going to put somebody with dementia and a five-year-old child who can barely read to memorize this long list of words. I'm going to give people of equal mental abilities the same list of words and the same amount of um, uh, support to help memorize this list. I can measure these things. So if you said this was falsifiable, well, you're right. Empirical research simply means that psychologists are collecting data by experimentation and observation. Before they set out to do this, they need a theory to help them understand and explain what they will test and observe. The goal is to support or disprove the theory because the sad truth is we can never actually prove a theory to be true. We can only support it until a better one comes along. Remember, we're talking about theories and not laws. Psychology is sometimes referred to as a soft science because it is interested in things that are difficult to measure, such as a person's sense of self-esteem. Some things are incredibly difficult to measure, po possibly even impossible. Do you think that there are some things that are simply not measurable, not quantifiable? What might they be? The last characteristic of a good theory is it is parsimonious. And that just simply means simple. In another co context, parsimonious might mean stingy or frugal, like cheap. But in the context of a good theory, it means that it is a simple theory. And this comes to us from William of Ockham, the 14th century philosopher, priest, and logician, who said that if there are several possible explanations that explain a theory, the one that is the simplest explanation is going to be the one that is the truest or the true explanation. So in order to explain something, take the simplest route with the least amount of explanation. Consider that great minds and great ideas also use simplicity or prove simplicity. Einstein used to say that if you could not explain something simply, you probably didn't know enough about it. You might have heard this quote as, if you can't explain it to your grandmother, then you don't really understand it. Consider the simplicity of Darwin's revolutionary idea that all of life on the planet evolved from one single cell organism, including our great brains. That's the simple theory. 
There's beauty in simplicity. So for the next class, we're going to look at how researchers design experiments, how they collect data, and how we understand the relationship of the variables that we are observing and testing in our experimentations. Remember to go to your Google document, the guided notes, and fill in the uh, blanks and try to answer the questions as well as keep uh, your own uh, notes of the videos in your Google Docs.